All right, what is up and welcome back to the Build A Better You podcast. In this episode, I talk to fellow great coach and friend of mine, Andy Tate, or Coach Tate us. Uh, specifically, in this episode, we talk about coaching. So, you know, why coaching is important for everyone, you know, why everyone needs it from time to time, even especially us coaches. Like, at the end of the day, we are all human. We all struggle with similar things. We all have other life commitments that are outside of fitness, and sometimes they may get... Uh, they might they might spiral out of control and we might lose control of them and we need someone to help us with a training program, nutrition program, and especially the accountability portion to keep us on point with our fitness. And so, yeah, it's important for everyone. And, you know, especially us fitness coaches and trainers, we're not immune to life because we're all human at the end of the day. And we also talk about how to best maintain your fat loss results uh why you shouldn't fire your coach after achieving your goals uh you should keep him around for at least a few months in order to help you maintain that and we also dive into rapid versus slow fat loss approach you know what are the pros and cons of each why you should do each and what conditions should qualify you for choosing between the two and we also talk about setting realistic expectations for yourself that you know not beating yourself up too hard uh, doing the best that you can in your given circumstances and lastly, we nerd out about hypertrophy, biomechanics, and bodybuilding, and all that good stuff towards the end. But yeah, it was, this was a really fun episode talking to Andy and getting to catch up with him. And I really do hope that you enjoy this episode. But that's enough talking for me. I have left uh, timestamps in the show notes below. So check those out if you do want to skip around and only listen to certain topics. But yeah, that about covers... All of it. I don't want to spoil too much, but hope you enjoyed this episode. All right, what's going on, Andy? What's new? Well, not a lot, mate. Just got my head down, trying to create as much content as possible right now. You know what it's like, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, quite busy with with clients, which is great. Trying to get my own training in check, um, mm-hmm. which is difficult when you've got a toddler running around, but. I think it helps you can empathize with parents that that need some help as well you know what I mean Mm -hmm. so yeah trying to figure that out right now but yeah man that's it what about you um not much I honestly everything's been going pretty well like I've been in kind of this just like rhythm of waking up every day uh making content servicing clients uh workouts have been going great Mm -hmm. um I don't know if you know Paul Carter I've been doing his like yoke squad thing so yeah, like I I thought so yeah I think you told me before yeah yeah and so like it just helps like so much having someone to like take care of like training and and all that like I just show up at the gym I have a plan and I'm ready to go I don't have to worry about my own programming totally mate I totally feel that and actually based on um our friend Jeff's advice I just reached out to Mike for Canty about mm-hmm. potentially him being my coach okay yeah, because like I feel like I need a coach, mate. Mm. You know, people think coaches don't need coaches, but we definitely do, you know, or at least some workouts program for us because we're like the last priority for ourselves, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm in the process of chatting to Mike about potentially being a client. He says he's open to it. So we're just kind of figuring some things out there. Mm-hmm. But I'm excited, mate, because I feel like this year has been absolute shit show in terms of my own training. I like I've mm-hmm. way prioritized my business, um, which is good. And I've been trying to help my clients, of course. But I've also been like, my daughter's been off sick a lot. Um, she's two and a half right now. So mm-hmm. she has been off daycare sick. And when she's off and I work from home, I'm the one that has to pick the <laughs> pick up the uh, the slack and look after her. And it means that business and training gets pushed to the side a little bit, which is quite stressful, but um, so I'm really excited about having someone hold me accountable because mm. like you said you know we're we're our last priority and you it's so nice to have a program that you know that someone else has done and you just turn up and do it you know what I mean mm-hmm. yeah so I'm excited about that I feel like I need that right now mm-hmm. yeah and um what has your training been looking like for the past year like like um I'd say responsibilities aside, like what has your program looked like? Because I'm sure everyone wants to know like, oh, personal trainer, they must have some sort of like secret work out there to do. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. We yeah, we keep our secrets to ourselves. No, not at mm-hmm. all. Um, so basically my background really is I did an, 
I did and coached and a little bit of competition in CrossFit for a long time for like five or six years I did that and I was coaching in a gym and and then when my daughter was born I was like I just don't have the time to focus on this my priority shifted towards you know being able to support my family and not just messing around doing CrossFit all the time I was doing way too much right uh, and then so sort of at that point I decided to get into bodybuilding ish like I've got no ambition to compete as a bodybuilder but I just like the idea that I can go into the gym and I can make progress on something um, and I'm staying healthy in the meantime so mm -hmm. it was quite nice actually because in CrossFit you know they talk about functional movements you know prioritizing all those kind of things and then you know almost taking the piss out of doing things like bicep curls so I went from that environment into then doing bicep curls and it felt so good mate yeah it felt nice to get a cheeky pump on I didn't feel I didn't leave the gym feeling completely drained and so that's what I've been doing for the last two to three two to three years two and a half years really mm -hmm. of that bodybuilding body <clears throat> style yeah mm -hmm. yeah I had a really good cut um about two years ago I did a really successful cut and I worked with a coach at that time too um, and then coronavirus rolled around mm -hmm. and the gyms closed and I was at home looking after my daughter less time to train um didn't eat as healthy as I should either um I'm a bit of a stress eater myself it's a work in progress, but um, so I was just like, I maintained weight pretty well since then. I, I gained some weight and just maintained. Um, and I feel like I've been trying to cut for the last year, but it's been like half assed. I haven't really been going all in. And so that's where it leads me to reaching out to a coach now because I need someone to hold me accountable, you know, just like mm -hmm. our clients do. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And then I did want to touch on, you said you didn't really have, um, that much of a problem maintaining so what what were you doing because i feel like a lot of people do struggle with this like they think the cutting part's easy but maintaining just like is simply very hard for them well that's a good point actually because what actually happened was and I, we can touch on on that part that you're asking me but uh -huh. what happened was i went from this cut and i went straight into a bulk and then the gyms closed and so i actually gained weight and I went back up to more than I originally started before I did that cut originally. So I started that cut at like 187 pounds and I got down to like 175 ish, I think. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm like 196. Um, but part of that has been muscle, but some of it is fat as well. I would mm -hmm. say that I'm around a similar body composition to when I first started that original cut, but I'm more muscular, obviously which is a good thing. So I've been maintaining at the upper range as opposed to losing body fat and maintaining that. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's a really good question you asked me. And actually it is difficult to, to go from a cut and then to maintain. And in hindsight, that's what I should have done. I shouldn't have gone straight into a bulk. Of course, I couldn't predict that all the gyms would close, et cetera. But right. um, the smart thing to would have to to do would have been to maintain my leaner body composition at that point and really dial in the habits of what it takes to maintain that kind of level of leanness. I'd say I was probably 10 to 12 body fat, percent body fat mm -hmm. at that point, um, which is the leanest I'd ever been. So yeah, in hindsight, I really wish I had just focused on maintaining at that point. And I stopped working with my coach as soon as I hit my goal big mm -hmm. mistake from from working with clients now and I see this problem come up it's like they make great progress and then they're like peace out I'm done and that's exactly what I did and it was a big mistake because I just wasn't able to I didn't I didn't have the accountability to hold myself to to really dial in the habits that it took to maintain that and that was a big mm -hmm. mistake from my part and I can see that now but I couldn't see it at the time mm -hmm. yeah so so what was your question again in terms of like advice around maintaining? Yeah, maintaining. So I feel like a lot of people are worried that like if they just like kind of like don't think about it, they just like will gain everything back. And I'm sure yeah. you didn't like gain everything back. So, you know, what would your advice be in terms of like 
that? Yeah, well, my advice would be you need to probably maintain your weight once you've kind of finished your cut um, for a period of maybe as long as it took to do the cut, maybe not quite as long, maybe, you know, two or three months to, to maintain mm -hmm. that. Really focus on eating the same foods that you were eating during your cut, but you now have more flexibility to enjoy certain other foods. So you can either just increase your portion sizes of current foods or being very careful, you can add some new foods in. And that you have to be very careful with that because if you slip into your previous habits, you know, of like, I don't know, snacking on certain foods that you can't hold your, you can't moderate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's important to be able to, to do it at a very gradual pace. And then the good thing about going from a cut to maintenance is you are, you do have more flexibility with your diet. And just to understand that you're allowed to have that flexibility without feeling like you've messed anything up, as long as you're able to maintain weight. That's what I would say, because it can be easy to feel the same guilt that you would have used to have had when you ate certain foods. And that could lead you to slipping back into bad habits of feeling like you messed up, feeling like you're going to overindulge on certain foods and then doing that and self-sabotaging almost, you know what I mean? So that's why I have to, that's why I say you have to be very careful of what you add back in to your diet at that point, it might be worth just, you know, for a couple of months, just increasing your portion sizes, and just trying to maintain weight a little bit before adding anything new back in. Um, and then really learning to manage that relationship with food, where you are able to eat foods without feeling guilty, and you are able to eat, eat foods in moderation. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, honestly, it's I think it's really hard to like ride that balance because once you've kind of like you're like once you have kind of like a plan to go into your cut I, I see a lot of people who do this they're like okay I'm going to cut out soda I'm going to cut out this I'm going to cut out that and then once they like get the ball rolling and then after they like finished let's say getting to their goals starting to like wanting to reincorporate those things back in they're like it's almost like scary yeah yeah and it it is scary and um, yeah, that's why you have to be careful because if you are, if you feel like you can moderate those foods, you know, everything in moderation, right? It's like, it's an important concept. Um, but if you feel like you can moderate those foods and you can have them within your diet without feeling guilty and that leading you to feel like a failure and then to binging, that kind of thing, then do it, add those foods back in. But if you feel like, hmm, I could do with just increasing my portion sizes before I gradually introduce those foods that I'd like to eat a little more. I mean, in an ideal situation, you would still be able to incorporate those kind of foods, even while you're on a diet, you know, but of course, in moderation, because the important thing about being on a diet and on a cut is feeling full is nice, you know, what I mean, like, there's always going to be a certain level of hunger. But like, if you can incorporate the foods that you still enjoy, within reason, and you're managing your hunger, that's great. Mm hmm. And then you've still got them in your diet when you kind of finish your cut. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of rewind and touch on that point where you made about uh, having a coach through the maintenance process. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, totally. could you, so could you kind of like go into more detail as to like why you think that's important? And like, because I know like, like, just like you said, a lot of people are like, once they reach their goal, they're like, oh, peace out. I don't really need anyone to help me anymore because I've gotten to my goal and like, that's kind of the reason why I got into this whole training thing, right? So Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's very important. Like I said, I really messed that up because I really wish I'd stayed longer with my coach at that time just to give me a few months of maintenance and then to say, okay, I'm good to manage this on my own. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it is important because of the accountability aspect. You know, you still got someone looking over your shoulder, checking your, your macros, checking your body weight. And because if you're doing it on your own, it's like it you say, all right, don't let the scale affect your emotion or whatever, you know, if the scale goes up or down, it, it of course, it's frustrating when it's you, right? It's, mm -hmm. And so it's so easy to start second guessing yourself again. And so if you've got that person in your corner looking over and checking uh, and, you know, built, bringing you back from a point of calories where you're deficit calories to a point where you're now at maintenance calories, which as you and I know, those new maintenance calories are not going to be the same as what you had previously if you've mm -hmm. lost a significant amount of body weight 
because you're obviously a lighter person, you know, uh, so it takes you less energy in order to do anything day to day. Plus, you may have had some um, reduction in metabolism due to adaptation that will come back as as you start to increase your calories up again. Um, but your maintenance calories are not going to be what they were. And so having someone in your corner looking over that, holding you accountable and so make sure you're not second guessing yourself is really really important because i've seen it too where clients have worked with me and have done the same thing um and and then you know there's that statistic i don't know how how true it is but like only five percent of people that do a diet are successful because you know and i'm part of that 95 percent. unfortunately like i'm not part of the five percent that did it because like I didn't get a handle on like my stress eating and, um, you know, during COVID it was difficult. I haven't raised a child and, you know, trying to work out from home. It was not ideal by any means. Um, but yeah, it's like, this is where the whole lifestyle change thing comes in. And so it has to be something that's sustainable. The approach needs to be sustainable. Otherwise, uh, yeah, the approach needs to be sustainable. Otherwise, the goal is not going to be sustainable. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you're only looking at changing your diet for, a, let's say, a 12 week cut, and then you're going back to what you've been doing originally, like that is only going to be a temporary result, unfortunately, because you need to buy into the whole lifestyle change. Mm-hmm. You know, it sounds it's like the least sexy thing, isn't it? Like yeah. sustainable weight loss and such. But it's, it is so important. You know, you need to buy into the fact that you are someone that trains now you are someone that goes to the gym and works on um, performance perhaps to a certain degree you know Mm -hmm. whether that's gaining muscle or gaining strength you you can work on that you're someone that manages you know you eat healthy you eat healthy food so you can feel full and energized throughout the day you know it's about coming up with that identity really and spending as much time as as that person so that when you're on your own and you don't have a coach those things are habitually built in and deviating away from that would be strange to you Mm -hmm. yeah so that's like when you put an end date on your cut or end date on your um approach it's like this has got to be for the rest of your life actually (laughs) to a certain degree of course you're not going to be restricted in terms of diet but you've got to buy into like the fact that you know you're going to be a new person, you know what I mean, to a certain level. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And an analogy I'd like literally just thought about is like your health is literally like every other commitment in your life. It's not just like some temporary thing that you can, you know, you can go get a trainer to like hopefully do this for like three to six months and then you don't have to worry about it ever again. It's like, yeah. you know, buying a house or buying a car. Like once you get that thing, like you have to maintain and take care of it or else it's going to like go to shit. Yeah. You don't use it. You lose it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You don't use it. You lose it. Yeah. So yeah, it's very true. It's very true. And uh, I think that's where a lot of people are like moving towards the quick, quick fix. I mean, I'm not sure about like who most of the people that follow you are, but like people that, train for have trained for a long time i think understand that it's about sustainability as opposed to how quickly can i do this um like for example we both know eugene teo right Mm -hmm. really awesome guy in the fitness space someone that i look up to a lot he has been recently posting about the fact that he's on a 1200 calorie diet Mm -hmm. and he's talking about how rapid you can do rapid weight loss. He's not doing it for long. He's just getting in, he's doing it and he's coming out. Uh, And that's great for him because he already has the base of training, eating healthy, and he's done it a lot. You know, he's gone through cycles of bulking and cutting, and he's very familiar with how, how in tune with his body he is. But for other people that have not had real success with weight loss that are trying to you know end their frustration with yo-yo dieting and really make something it's not a feasible approach yep sorry about that we had some technical difficulties (laughs) but we're back at it (laughs) yeah so what i was saying was eugene would be able to maintain body weight on like 3000 to 3500 calories a day and he's cutting way back on a daily basis to like 1200 
And so he's got the experience of doing many cuts in the past and he's very in tune with how his body's going to react. Like he's, he's people that we as coaches look up to. And so his approach isn't for everyone. And that's another thing where it's like, if someone has success with something, it doesn't mean that you're going to have success with something. I'm mm-hmm. going off on tangents, mate, all day. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, same um, here. <laughs> yeah. So my, my point is like, he's doing that rapid approach, but for the majority of people, they need to dial in new habits um, first. Like he's mm-hmm. already got the base of doing, eating certain foods. And so he's able to do that. Yeah. Whereas other people, I think it's better to take a slightly slow approach. Yeah. So I'm sure like some people do want to know the answer to this. It's like, what makes me a good candidate for rapid weight loss? Because I know we all want results fast. So yeah. yeah, what what should we be asking ourselves? Like if we should consider doing rapid weight loss or for the or the more slow and steady approach? Well, good question, really. Uh, yeah, it does depend on who's who's doing it. I would say if you're someone that has done bulks and cuts and has been training for years and that can has really got a handle on not just the physiological but the mental aspects of going through a cut and you're able to mentally handle that you know not everyone is I, I don't think I'd be able to do that I'd get sick of eating so little but if that's you then yeah maybe you could do that and it's highly likely you won't lose that much muscle as long as you don't do it for too long you know, if you're going to reduce calories by a significant amount per day, you know, maybe doing it for four to six weeks, six weeks max, and then being done with it. Um, The other thing is, of course, how much weight people have to lose probably. But then I would still base it off of a percentage of their total body weight. So Mm. uh, when I work with my clients, I do anything from between 0.5% of their total body weight to 1% of their total body weight. Mm -hmm. And so that might not seem like a lot, but in terms of like minimal negative effect on their lifestyle, as they know it, you know, sometimes that slower approach can be helpful, but still, if you're a 200 pound person losing two pound a week on a regular basis, like if I was to try and lose two, if I was trying to lose two pound a week, for example, I'm close Mm -hmm. to 200 pound. I'd have to cut my calories by a thousand per day. I maintain weight, unfortunately for me, at around 2,500, maybe just less than that, 24 mm. to 2,500 calories per day. So that means I'd have to eat 1,400 to 1,500 calories per day. And I, I know that I'm not going to feel satiated at all. You know, maybe for a couple of weeks, I could keep that up. But otherwise, it's just going to be really awful. You know, it's going to mm-hmm. be impacting my 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 mood, my energy levels, my training. And so although two pound a week can seem like it's not even that fast, it really is. So I would probably get go closer to 0.5% of my body weight, which would be a pound a week, because then I still have some flexibility within my diet to, um, to enjoy certain types of food, which is important because we just talked about how when you finish your diet, you know, you don't want to go ahead and just add a load of stuff back in unless you feel like you can moderate it. So the st- the fact that you can still enjoy food, which is important to a lot of people, you know, they go out for social events, etc., cetera, um, family and friends. It's, um, it's nicer to take that slow approach, but it, to a lot of people, when I say, okay, we're going to aim for like, you know, say if it's like a, a more petite woman and I say, we're going to aim for like half a pound to 0.75 pound per week. It can seem like, Oh, this is going to kind of go on forever. Um, but you know, if you think about 12 weeks of consistent effort, you're going to lose between like six to nine pounds during 12 weeks, uh, mm-hmm. if you're consistent with that. So, yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I mean, when I, I know when I first started in the coaching, there's like, there was this huge push for like, you know, slow and sustainable and like, you know, stay away from rapid fat loss. But the more I learn now, it's like, it's whatever works best for each individual. Like I think by and large, a lot of people will do better with the slow and sustainable route, but there are like a few select people where it's like, if they do have kind of the, like the motivation or the discipline or whatever you want to call it to just like, you know, go in really hard for like four to six weeks. Like if you're doing like a huge cut and you can just go in and out with that. Yeah. And like, and 
like yeah I've I've been following Eugene and uh, Paul Carter for a while now and like they they both like do that like really aggressive approach where they go on a like a huge deficit and go on a cut like Paul Carter is like two dude's like 220 230 pounds of like pure muscle and he like his deficit is like 1800 calories which is like very little for a guy of his like stature yeah 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 and like basically they say like as long as literally as long as you're training hard enough to get that like anabolic signal and eating enough protein like you won't lose any muscle yeah i heard that too but again those two people are very in tune with this right they've been doing it Mm -hmm. a lot for a long time and they know how their bodies were going to react and they know that they've got the habits that when they're done they can come back to maintenance not feel too restricted and just continue on with their habits that they have in place Mm -hmm. here's the thing that i've heard from lane norton um mike is and a few other people in the space is when when you finish or like let me start this again right if you gain weight rapidly if you gain fat rapidly and your body is almost wanting to do that if you finish an aggressive cut so if you don't have the habits in place this is what i'm worried about for certain people that might want to take this approach if they're not really in tune but if you gain weight and fat very rapidly not only do you increase the fat stores because you're gaining fat but your body actually creates new fat stores have you heard that yeah yeah i have heard of that Mm -hmm. yeah and so not only are you refilling the fat stores that you've lost body fat from during that extreme period this is if you go way into a surplus, of course, mm-hmm. a calorie surplus after your cut. Um, you're not only going to fill up those fat stores again, but you're also going to create new fat stores, which I believe can be problematic when it comes to hormone signaling from fat stores to be needed to be replenished. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the only thing that I would say for me I still don't feel that I'm in a position where if I was to do something that extreme, I could just go back because I feel for me, um, and this isn't everyone, but I know a lot of people might, might resonate. It's like, I still don't have the the best habits built around food. You know, I, I stress eat. If I'm stressed, I'm like, man, I, I just need something in my stomach. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. a, it's just how it is. Um, and like I said, it's work in progress, but for someone like that, you know, because your body's going to be going under a lot of physiological stress, if you do such an aggressive diet, that when you get to the other side, your body's going to be almost screaming out for more food. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be very in tune to, to go from that to maintain. That's the only worry that I have. I've not done an aggressive cut on purpose in the past. So mm-hmm. it's hard for me to say, but I would worry that for me, I would go from that point and just, it's just another failed cut. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. to kind of go off your point of like the, the gaining the fat stores thing, like, I think, I think um, that's why like a lot of the reason why people are like overweight and stuff, it's a lot of, it has to do with genetics. I mean, obviously like obesity itself is like a very complex disease with like mm-hmm. environmental impacts, but like a lot of it is genetics too. And I've mm-hmm. heard that's why, like once once you have those fat stores, you can always lose or like refill them, but you can't necessarily like lose fat cells without that's like right. surgery yes. or something. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that's that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah, and I got this information from uh, Lane Norton's book Fat Loss Forever, mm. um, and I think Mike Isretel talks about it in one of his either videos or books. But yeah, so you're creating more fat cells. Yeah. Uh, And there you're able to store fat in those fat cells. And yes, you can reduce body fat from drawing fat out of the cell to be used as energy, but Mm. you can't get rid of those fat cells themselves, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you gain more fat cells, you've got those forever. Yeah. All right. So we are going to take a quick intermission 
and just want to say thank you so much for listening to this podcast and thank you so much for making it this far in this episode and I want to take a quick break and introduce you to today's sponsor of the podcast Legion Supplements so first off a few reasons why I decided to work with Legion Legion really does take a 100% transparent and no BS approach to introducing its supplements rather than simply trying to sell you supplements under the notion of trust me bro they actually aim to educate you about their products if you go to their website under every single product on their website they list every single ingredient with their exact dosages which means no proprietary blends why they have chosen those specific ingredients and those specific dosages and even the most up-to-date research to back everything up that they are claiming and saying legion's main priority is providing quality service and products they believe in their service and products so much that if for any reason you're not satisfied you can send them an email fill out their form and they will give you a full refund on the spot no questions asked And it's for these reasons alone why I think they are the best of the best and why I have continued taking their products year after year and why I've decided to work with them after they reached out. So yeah, they are just an awesome company all around. And if you're already taking supplements anyway, you're probably likely taking a multivitamin, fish oil, some sort of whey protein in some form. You likely want the best for your body. And I truly believe Legion is the best of the best. So go ahead and check out their products. They're such an awesome company. Um, yeah, be sure to use my discount code AC at checkout to save yourself 20% off your first order. And I'll leave the link to their website in the show notes below. But yeah, thank you so much for your support. Thank you for listening. And let's get back to this episode. Um, and then I don't know, this is where like, I, maybe you'd know a little bit more than me, but um, when the fat cells become depleted, they signal a a hormone um i don't know if it's what's the name of do you know the name of the hormone Um, maybe yeah is that the hunger hormone leptin and ghrelin confused me a little bit i think yeah yeah i think maybe leptin but i'm not 100 percent sure don't quote me on that but i think it's it's, i think it's ghrelin that makes you yeah ghrelin yeah the, the way i remember is ghrelin makes you growl right makes you hungry yeah right yeah Mm -hmm. so anyway either one of those two but um maybe you're right there it's your fat stores are going to be signaling like oh shit we are like losing stored energy and Mm -hmm. from an evolutionary an evolutionary buddy i can't even say (laughs) evolutionary perspective like your body's going to be like oh you know we need to fill these signaling to you to eat more um potentially this might not happen but it's definitely a consideration if you're not like if you don't have good habits around nutrition dialed in i think that's the main point if you've got a healthy nutrition regime and you know you've been doing this for a while you've been going to the gym for a while and you feel like you could do an aggressive cut and then just go back to um maybe a slightly lighter maintenance and you're pretty confident that you can do that then yeah bloody go for it because then you can get the job done in like a short period of time. Uh, you're not going to risk losing much body body muscle. Um, and then, but yeah, so, but for the most of the people that I've kind of worked with, hasn't quite been that demographic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, me neither here. Like, that's why I said, like, by and large, like, most people should be taking that slow and sustainable route so that they can, you know, learn all the tools that come with like people who are able to do aggressive cuts because they've like literally probably tracked macros and calories for like years. And like, they know their body. Well, they know which foods like satiate them. Yeah. 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 And I'm a coach that helps people with weight loss, but yeah, I, I would be worried about trying that because I feel like I've still got a lot of work to do myself. Um, But I, there's a, uh, I took a picture of women's health. I think it is or women's world. Oh man. Um, dude it's awful it's really awful and it's like is that one of those uh stupid magazines you see at the grocery store yeah mate i see them like every time i go in there i have a little oh my god look lose 30 pounds in two weeks it's just painful and Mm -hmm. and um it's it really sucks mate especially Mm -hmm. for women that um read these types of magazines Mm -hmm. and yeah it's it's horrible because yeah we both know that that's not a good approach right (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah i I don't know if you uh follow eric roberts but i think he posted on his story like last week or something 
on like one of those magazines and he's like and it's like and it's no wonder why we see so many people especially women because a lot of those magazines are geared toward women it's like it's no it's like literally yeah no surprise why like women form these like poor relationship with foods have these unrealistic expectations of what weight loss is supposed to look like yeah and so like when they hear like oh you one to two pounds a week is good they're like what i, I feel like i should be losing yeah. faster than this yeah that's the thing and as well like i did actually see that and um one thing that jordan syatt had said in the past was um something about what's the biggest reason people fail someone asked him that and he said not it's like it's not the people giving up when it's not working but it's people giving up even when it is working mm -hmm. you know it's like people give up even when they are making progress but they feel like it's not fast enough mm -hmm. that is like mind-blowing yeah it's, yeah <laughs> comment, I, I think because i see that so much you yeah. know i check in with all my clients once a week and they and i can tell that sometimes it's like oh you know i'm not very happy with my rate of weight loss and i'm just like you've lost weight like every single week yeah and it's been like pretty close to like the target you know mm -hmm. and so it's it's a shame it really is a shame mm -hmm. yeah like and i think i made a post about this like the other day it's like it like literally for i i can say honestly like ask yourself honestly like it does it matter does it actually matter to you if you get to your goal in whether it's four weeks or four months or four years like what's going to matter most to you like what is are you going to get there? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, mate. It's kind of like business stuff as well to a certain degree, because mm -hmm. um, I have, I have people reach out to me on Instagram saying, Hey, do you want to get to 10,000 followers? Or, you know, or do you want to get to like, do you want to earn like $10,000 a month in <laughs> like in three months? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, of course, mate. Yeah. Oh, I'm not falling for your, for your shit. You know what I mean? Like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating when people just reach out and it's like, you know, I can, I can make you become like earning this amount of money in this amount of time. It's the same that goes to a lot of people that get marketed to about fitness. It's like the promise, but that can't be delivered, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, sure. You might be able to like, get to that goal but how long are you able to like keep it up and like that that's what really matters because what's the point of like hey you know I lost like 30 pounds in four weeks but you know I gained it all back in like two weeks and it's yeah, like it just becomes totally. a memory it doesn't become like part of your <laughs> yeah. lifestyle yeah you don't get to like totally, say yeah. hey I I did this for the rest of my life you just say it, it just it's like it's like <laughs> I just thought it's it's like um you know that guy at the gym who always says you know back in back when i was like 20 something back years old I used to, yeah i used to bench 405 or something <laughs> yeah yeah that'll be me soon mate i'm yeah. like 30, i'm 34 now uh, uh, yeah and um so it's important to um to remember that just like anything in life everything is work in progress you know like your career is work in progress of course, we retire at some point, hopefully, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, it's working, everything is work in progress. And so you can't think that, you know, your health and fitness is just going to be done in a certain period of time. It's like, no, you need to work on this forever. And so you need to find something that you enjoy and stick with it um, and find ways to keep enjoying it and keep yourself, um, yeah, keep yourself enjoying it, I suppose. And then understand that there's going to be ups and downs. Like, for example, myself, like there was a very good point where I finished my cut and then the world completely changed out of my control. Um, could I have handled it better? Yes. And that's a work in progress. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be points where maybe you do regress, maybe your back squat, and this is actually inevitable, right? As we get yeah. older, like back squats, strength is obviously going to go down. Um, you probably will at some point start to gain weight and you kind of have to be okay with that. Uh, and you just got to ride the wave a little bit and just do your best. I think that's, that's quite an important point because um, like, I think James Smith mentioned this, it's like maintaining weight doesn't necessarily mean always being the same weight. It mm -hmm. means like, okay, maybe I gained a few pounds. I lose a few pounds, you know, and that's okay. Different mm -hmm. priorities call for different, um, different times of your life and such. So, yeah. Yeah. And I like that point you said about like, 
doing the best you can because you know like life is always going to throw us curveballs and like i think uh yeah when i think jordan did like a q and a and he like one of the questions was like you know does like losing fat or does building muscle or whatever like goals people have does that get harder as you age and he's like yeah it does get harder just like everything else in life because as you age things become more difficult just because of the way life is you know you have more responsibilities you know the body ages and it's just like things do get harder but it's like what are you gonna do about it <laughs> yeah yeah really good point and uh, i think that shows that it's good to have certain types of goals like gaining muscle especially while you're younger right it's like gaining muscle mm -hmm. gaining strength losing body fat um and you know the gaining muscle and losing body fat is very like an what we would call like an extrinsic goal which is like an external goal that's like i want to look good i want to look like in, impress people to a certain degree of course like mm -hmm. it's empowering and you build confidence of course but it really comes down to more of an in intrinsic goal and intrinsic motivator of you're doing this because it's healthy you mm -hmm. know like i said it's great to have goals of building muscle maybe even like it's fine to want to look better you know uh, mm -hmm. but it really comes down to you need to be in this for the long term because not just do you love it but it's healthy you mm -hmm. know of course it makes you look uh, muscular it makes you look um lean for, of course but it also yeah. improves bone density you know improves connective tissue around your joints so mm -hmm. that stuff can't be over overlooked especially as you get older mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah yeah definitely and like i think the point you made about like doing it for vanity like honestly i don't think there's anything wrong with doing things for vanity like one of the one of the, the personal trainers i spoke with like a while ago he says like yeah there's nothing wrong with wanting to work out for vanity because otherwise we wouldn't do things do other things for vanity like we wouldn't get up you know do our hair do our makeup brush our teeth and all this other stuff to make ourselves yeah. like look better and presenters yeah. make ourselves look presentable but it's it's also the fact that like why are you doing it like no one just wants to you know get jacked or look fit for like no reason people do it because you know it could be like the the way they looked you know 10 20 years ago and that's where they felt their best and that's where they felt yeah. like you know alive and confident and really good about their bodies and you know or maybe they have associated with those with like life events that's when they were like life was like better it was less stressful they could yeah. actually take care of themselves yeah. yeah no i totally agree with that and i definitely see a movement in the industry that's leaning towards like anti-diet but i do agree with you i think it's fine to work out for for vanity reasons um you just have to be okay with if you make a regression at some point mm -hmm. that you don't feel worse about yourself because i think that's important like okay training and such makes you feel good makes you look good but there's going to be times where it moves backwards and you just have to be okay with that um which isn't easy of course yeah and um one experience for me is i like, i don't think that I would be where I am now in terms of a relationship with my partner and might have a child if I didn't take time to work on my own physique, my own health and fitness. Um, and I don't think that, not saying that like my partner is shallow because I think mm -hmm. she would date me regardless. But in terms of my confidence and my ability to approach women or it's situations where I'm going on a date and such right mm -hmm. I think I'd be much more and then I was much more shy nervous around that without having you know the confidence that I have from just going to the gym and feeling empowered and feeling like I'm taking care of myself and I feel like I look good right it's like it's mm -hmm. like, cheeky little glance in the mirror mate flex the old tricep yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah when you walk past the mirror you're like oh who the hell is that <laughs> yeah who's that yeah. cheeky little chap yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> cheeky devil <laughs> oh man yeah right, yeah, right. yeah yeah it's, and it's like yeah it's all those yeah for me too it's it was such like just a huge confidence booster for me like you know not even just like looking better but like all the confidence of like you know when you go in the gym and you're setting prs and like it takes some level of confidence to go in there and be like you know, okay, today 
it's like, okay, or last session, I did this much amount of weight today. It's like, I feel a little bit nervous hitting this new weight or this new max. And then, I, but I have to go in there and do it. If I want my body to change, and if I want to keep pushing myself. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's one thing Jeff and I talked about on his podcast was, you know, like sending a, cause he was asking about motivation and I was saying like, you need to set yourself a goal and come up with a plan to achieve that goal. And then once you've got that plan, motivation is going to come and go you just got to turn up anyway in it mm-hmm. you just got to turn up and get it done because you've got a plan you know what you need to do the hardest part is getting there once you're there you just get cracking mm-hmm. yeah yeah and like that's that's one of the things i say about like hiring a coach all the time it's like we're not going to do the work for you we just have the plan and all you have to do is execute and it's like it doesn't do the work for you but it helps you kind of it helps you kind of shortcut that path like you don't have to figure everything out and then execute you you just have that plan ready to go and then you yeah. just have to put in the work but with that exactly. being said it's like hiring a coach isn't magic is it it's not going to just magically get you results like i'm sure yeah. you ha- you've had like a few clients at least who like hire you and then they don't do anything and then they ghost you and they're just like dude what the heck <laughs> yeah i think for the most part i've been pretty lucky with um with people that have signed on with me um in that sense but yeah there's definitely been there's definitely been a few that it's just like some people don't even check in Mm -hmm. and I feel like are they just paying me so they can say like I've got a coach and and such and makes them feel a little bit better if so Mm -hmm. that's okay you know um but yeah if you really want to see some good results you've got to show up and and put the work in like we're we're there as coaches to guide you and not do the work for you unfortunately mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and like honestly i'd say like for those people who uh, like do struggle with that it's like honestly just get someone in person i think that would benefit them so much more because you know you actually have to show up to a place at a certain time versus like online it no it's a it's much harder so you need to have like some kind of base level of commitment already yeah totally and i have clients that i do in person as well that wouldn't do well online because they need me to be there waiting for them (laughs) to come in you know what i mean so yeah yeah no i totally get that i think that's a really good point for like for beginners that don't understand the technique it would be great to have some sessions to learn that before going with an online coach or if you're someone that really needs that extra layer of accountability knowing that you have time scheduled with a trainer and that's the only thing that's going to keep you accountable. And for some people that that is, you know, it's like they've got other things going on in their life that are putting them in different directions. So yeah, everyone's at a different point, but you got to find what works for you really, because health is, is important. Isn't it? Yeah, cool. So uh, I did want to, uh, the last, I guess the last topic of this podcast, we have like, you know, 10, 20 minutes left. So uh, let's talk, let's, let's just jive on some like bodybuilding stuff. Okay. I mean, it sounds yeah, good. That, like lately that that's what I've been like, just getting really interested in like, just, you know, muscle building, how to optimize that, like hypertrophy, biomechanics, just all that good stuff. And personally, yeah. I think for most people's goals, like hypertrophy is going to get you to like where you want to go. Cause like the more I learn about it, it's like good hypertrophy is it helps you build muscle, which, you know, has all the added benefits of building muscle, you know, helps you look better, you know, uh, improves like joint strength and all that, all that stuff that you listed off uh, previously. And it like good hypertrophy mechanics do just strengthen the muscle tissue. So it can actually help you decrease like joint pain and all that, and actually improve like your body mechanics and your movement quality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that I've been learning recently from, I paid for Eugene's Gambaru method. Okay. Yeah. So I've been diving into some of his lectures actually on there and some of the biomechanics stuff is, is quite cool. And he's made me believe that, you know, barbells, dumbbells are not the be all and end all for hypertrophy training. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of just as Mike Isretel would say, the stimulus to fatigue ratio, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you, the exercise is provides a great stimulus but provides a certain level of fatigue as well. And talking about barbells, the amount of weight that you have to lift and the amount of stabilization your body has to go through to lift that weight 
is hugely fatiguing in comparison to how stimulating it is for the muscle to grow mm -hmm. as opposed to using cable machines. Right. And so as a crossfitter in the past, going from like, you know, we had to the term like we don't use machines, we are machines, that kind of yeah. thing. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, cool. Now it's like science has kicked us in the face with that one. You know, yeah. you can build an insane amount of muscle by, you know, just using the machines and you don't get too, you don't get as fatigued as um, as using like barbells and stuff. Mm -hmm. But one question I have for you then is like you do Paul Carter's programming. Yeah. And most of my programming principles I got from Renaissance periodization, Mike Isratel, mm -hmm. where we would talk about like your relative intensity. So reps in reserve mm -hmm. and how close you push to failure in your sets. Mm -hmm. So generally the approach that I take with my clients is like, I do like a four or five week mesocycle and we progress from three reps in reserve in week one, Week two is two reps in reserve. Week three is two reps in reserve. Week four is one rep in reserve. And then week five is generally a deload. Mm -hmm. Then I change up some exercises, change up some rep schemes and progress that program from there. How do you go about programming for your clients uh, or for yourself when it, comes to, when it comes to training close to failure, et cetera? Gotcha. Yeah. So that's a good question. So yeah, it, I, in terms of that, like most of my clients, I don't really periodize anything just because they, you know, they haven't been training for that long. So they don't, they don't need like some special periodization program. We just focus on, you know, progressive overload, adding more weight or adding more reps week to week, month to month. And like, I think that's going to get people training pretty close to failure. Cause I think if you're constantly adding weight or adding reps week over week, month over month, you're eventually going to reach that point where like, oh shit, this weight is pretty hard. Like even if you started five, six reps in reserve for like that, that first week and you start adding and then you're just, you're going to reach a point where like you're obviously because your body's not going to like forever adapt so that that weight's going to always feel like five to six reps in reserve. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for the majority of my clients, I do it like that. And then, yeah, in terms of like Paul Carter's programming, his was like, you do no reps in reserve like <laughs> yeah. Savage, yeah uh huh yeah but for and, most of those exercises are they would they be more cable based exercises where the stimulus to fatigue ratio is a little bit more favorable yeah yeah so it's a lot of it is like cables dumbbells machines we have some barbell movements depending on like if it's like an rdl or if it's like a glute bridge those are good right. movements to do with barbells but for the yeah, majority of other movements like they yeah that's one of the things too it's it doesn't barbells don't fit a lot of people's structures really well and then and this is also something i kind of have like you know personal experience with like for the longest time i could never build my barbell bench and it always gave me shoulder problems mm -hmm. and it wasn't until i like completely ditched the barbell bench press and i just switched the dumbbells i'm like my shoulder feels a lot better my strength is actually starting to go up now and like everything changed and that's because the barbell is just a fixed straight bar and you're just yeah. like kind of locking your joints and you have to move around that bar. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you use cables, dumbbells, machines, they fit a lot of people's structures better. You get a little bit more freedom of movement. So mm -hmm. that way you're actually able to line things up better, stress the actual muscle tissue and not beat up like your soft tissue in the process. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that, I think that's a really good point. It's also really hard to push the bench press if you're on your own. <laughs> Mm -hmm. isn't it but one thing i'm struggling with right now is like i've got a garage gym a garage as we would say mm -hmm. in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> i've got a garage gym there and it's just barbell squat rack dumbbells uh, i've got an adjustable bench i don't have a pulley system yet but i'm thinking about buying one mm -hmm. um and then i also train at the gym that i work at which is a crossfit and weightlifting gym so it's again it's barbells it's dumbbells it's like a rig where you can do pull-ups and stuff and there's only one station where they've got like a small cable machine mm -hmm. and so man i'm like i'm really trying to to find ways to train where i'm not too fatigued by by using that and i'm really tempted to go and join a local gym that's like got all the machines um but i haven't pulled the plug on that yet because 
mate, if my, if my partner finds out that I've got all this gym equipment I've bought and then I'm joining the gym, she's going to go yeah. absolutely crazy, mate. So oh, I just got to tread very carefully around that. But I would love to have more access to cable machines because like the thought, mate, of doing, and this is one of the things that got started to get to me when the gyms were open, it was summer of this year, actually, and I'm wearing a mask to squat. Mm-hmm. and like I'm trying to do heavy back squats and trying to progress my squat um, and trying to progressively overload it because that's one of the only things that you can do for legs when you've only got a barbell and stuff mm-hmm. right it's like of course I could be more creative um, but it mentally I was like I don't even want to do legs anymore mm-hmm. um, luckily enough my legs are pretty big so I could just focus on upper body and I'd be happy really yeah it doesn't take much yeah but the thought of going in and doing like heavy sets of squats and trying to progress that it's like oh man I just I just can't stomach it right now Mm -hmm. um so that's where I think I'd love to have access to more machines and play around with those so that's cool and I think you know you're able to push a lot closer to failure without getting too fatigued on those kind of things whereas like a squat it's like your whole body is like stabilizing that weight keeping you balanced and you have to go fucking heavy really mm-hmm. to a certain degree relatively to yourself of course but yeah yeah so i like what you said though about the fact you don't do anything strict periodization when it comes to newer lifters um mm-hmm. because really they could go in the gym and lift not even that close to failure and still see some pretty good results right mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, sorry, quick bathroom break, small bladder problems. <laughs> but yeah, oh uh, yeah, in terms of uh are you good? You're lagging. Yeah, I think your zoom's lagging a little bit. Why do you think it's my zoom? Or is it my I think zoom? it's your zoom. Is mine? I don't know, oh, but I just don't like the fact you're blaming me, mate. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, you're just like moving around really slow. So I don't know if it's your end or my end. I Could, be my it seemed, Could be my fault. Could be my crappy internet. Yeah, you're right. It's my fault. No, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all me. It's all me, bro. Yeah. But yeah, uh, periodization. Yeah, for most people... Um, like they, I, I don't think they honestly need like some sort of periodization routine just because most people aren't training enough, tra- training hard enough in the first place. So they don't need like some sort of like training cycle or training block. They can just simply focus on progressive overload, probably do that for at least three to five years until you start like needing to do all these like fancy stuff that like periodization offers. And uh, yeah, yeah that that's pretty much it. And then also the other thing too, like a lot of people, yeah, they like really underestimate how hard they train. So that's also the other thing. Like, so they're probably, they're probably not even pushing themselves hard enough to see enough progress in the first place. And like, yeah, there's that the whole research thing about like, oh, you can get similar effects training, like really like two failure versus like training one RIR, but it's like most people underestimate that so for sure yeah yeah, it's like are you even going to one like a true one rir because even myself who has been training for years like sometimes like i'm not pushing as like or i can bust out so many more reps than i thought i could so it's kind of hard finding that like like true feeling of what it feels like to train you know whether that's three versus one reps in reserve yeah Totally. I totally agree. It is hard to judge that you get better at it, but like, even when I would do a four week mesocycle with a one week deload, like week three, I'd be like, I'd be stopping at like six reps, let's say on the squat. And I'd be like, okay, two reps in reserve. And then I have to push like to zero reps in reserve the next week. I up the weight and I go to like 10, 10 reps. Mm -hmm. And so you can grind out more reps than you think. But that's not a good thing because it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it feels so horrible. Yeah, exactly. And like, I don't know. That's the thing where it's like, how can I, am I able to do that once every fourth week, you know, of really push to that intensity? Oh, man, 
that's where I just love to have some cable stuff. Like I actually just bought a leg extension and leg curl mm. attachment for my bench. So yeah. you load the plates on it. I don't think it's ideal for certain positions because um, it's not cable. So the, the weight intensity is like not distributed the same throughout the whole movement. Mm. But I'm excited to do a leg day just using that kind of stuff, mate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And like, yeah, that's, one that. the yeah. <laughs> that's one of the things. Yeah. That's one of the things too about machines and dumbbells and cables. Like you can manipulate the resistance profile if you want to like get all like sciencey and technical about it. Um, totally, also, yeah. I did make, I just did make a podcast on this like two weeks ago, if you want to check it out, but <laughs> great, but yeah. Um, yeah. Resistance profiles, basically like how hard does an exercise feel at certain ranges certain of motion? Points. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. Cause if you think about like a, like a, a leg curl, a hamstring curl, I would often do those laying down face, face down on the bench, have someone put the dumbbell between my toes, between my feet. And then I would lower that down and then pull it back up. Right. Mm. Of course, as I get to the top, closer to the top, it's like, it, it's, it's doing less the further up it gets, you know, mm -hmm. because there's no, um, the position of the dumbbells, not really applying any pressure to my hamstring after a while. Mm -hmm. So you can't really get, full range of motion with tension there um, mm -hmm. and actually some cable machines are set up now where you can load the ca the machine in different areas to to feel different points of um of tension mm -hmm. yeah um i don't know if you do you know prime fitness equipment no no they're, there's like they're basically the brand of fitness equipment that's like recommended by coach cast and paul and stuff and right. like they're like basically top of the line. I saw some of it's like it's beautiful, dude. Some of their machines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. if you like to nerd out about like gym equipment, that's definitely yeah. like <laughs> the place of but yeah, a lot of their machines are plate loaded and like you can put the plates in like different areas. Different positions, and it'll, yeah. Yeah. It'll change the like the resistance profile. Dude. Which is sick. It's so funny, mate. This is where like you're getting really into the details yeah. that certain people don't need to know about, but it's so fun to geek out about anyway, <laughs> isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually thinking of doing um, the N1 education biomechanics course at some point mm -hmm. in the next, I don't know, few months maybe. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so first off, I'm going to see and try and work with a coach and see if I can just make some progress on my own goals first. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe I'll do that yeah yeah so yeah if if you were looking for like i would check out prime fitness they're a functional trainer mm -hmm. it looks pretty sick i mean i'm not telling you right. you have to buy it but uh if you do <laughs> right. I would probably, I'll have a look. I, I, yeah <laughs> i'm sure it's I, quite expensive <laughs> yeah yeah i think it's yeah it's definitely expensive but they're like top of the line and yeah. low-key if you did i would probably live vicariously through you well, we both live in Vancouver, don't we? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just different Vancouvers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll just <laughs> drive up like six to eight hours for a little gym sesh. <laughs> That's it, mate. A cheeky little yeah. gym sesh. Cheeky yeah. pump and then you can go home again. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, that about covers everything i wanted to ask you and we're like close to an hour so yeah i think we're so over for... because there's been a few recordings oh or yeah is it one recording yeah i can't tell anymore because then they it got broke the recordings got broken up but uh we're at 43 minutes for this one so i think we're pretty close oh, okay right so yeah yeah thanks so much uh for coming on andy and before Pleasure. we head out where can people find you people can find me on mostly on instagram my handle is at coach taters. I'm sure you'll leave it in the, uh, the show notes or whatever people yeah, say. Yeah, I'll put in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then for next year, I'm really going to have a big push on YouTube, which would be Andy Tate, um, my YouTube channel, Andy Tate. So I'm going to try and get one video out a week because as you can tell by this podcast, if you're still listening, you know, we like to talk. I find it yeah. really difficult to get like, information down into a 15 second clip when i like to talk in more detail about it so that's why i'm going to try and push a little more on youtube next year so mm. that's where i'll be 
yeah and then we're kind of like we like like to like ramble on and like go on random tangents so it's hard i know yeah. to stay on topic <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know but no i enjoyed the chat mate i appreciate you uh having me on yeah yeah of course yeah we'll have to do this again soon sometime absolutely but yeah thanks for coming on and i'll talk to you soon all right cheers mate all right, and that about wraps it up for this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode with Andy and I as we jived on so many topics. It was such a fun podcast to do. It was fun catching up and talking to Andy. Uh, but yeah, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a five-star review or like the video or do whatever it is this platform on to help boost the engagement and to let me know that you actually enjoyed this topic of the podcast and you are enjoying the podcast so far. And yeah, be sure to leave a review that tells me what you want to see more of specifically or even what specifically you enjoyed about the podcast. Definitely helps let me know that there are actual people behind the reviews that are left. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Be sure to check out Andy, some of his stuff. He makes great content. Also, check out Legion Supplements. Be sure to use my discount code AC to support me and get 20% off your first order. But yeah, thank you so much for tuning in and I will catch you in the next one.